what an awesome passage we have today. <clears throat> Here's what Paul writes to us, Philippians 1.6. Paul says, And being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until that day of Jesus Christ. He will carry it to completion and finish it in our lives. You know, as we've been going through this whole sermon series, and I would say we finally reached the end of the sermon series, and you say, then, preacher, how come you still have it up there on the screen? Well, because we're kind of adding on to it. Let's put it that way. It's an attitude check. We're called to have the attitude of Jesus, and Paul gives that to us in Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Uh, tons of, of attitudes that we are supposed to have within our lives and last week we talked about, as a kind of the concluding part of that uh, passage, to put into practice God's saving work in our life. And that's talking about our sanctification. Uh, God's um, literally done the saving work, and he's changing us and helping us be the people that we are called to be and he's made us to be. And we have to put that into work. And also in our calling of who we are and what we're called to do and, and step out in ministry, Paul says, put that into work. We have a part to play as we surrender our lives to God. In fact, Paul tells us we have to put it into practice. And I'm going to build on that message from last week and hopefully help us understand even more fully, and this is the, the neat thing. I truly believe this, that God has, is this master artist. Let's call it that. He's a master artist who always finishes what he starts. And we're going to see this today. So if you have a Bible with you and you can flip through there, we start out... Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, and, and here's what Paul says. He says, Paul says, I'm writing this to you, and Timothy's here with me too. See, Paul and Timothy were here, and we are servants of Jesus. And you could just pass right past that and not even think anything about it. But he's saying something very powerful in the midst of that. We are servants of Jesus. You see, there's kind of a double connotation that's coming out of this. Um, Everybody there in Philippi, as he writes this, and in, and in their culture would understand when Jesus uses that word saying, I am a servant of Jesus, a slave of Jesus, he, he's literally, everyone understood what a slave was. It meant that there's a person who belongs to another. That's a person who is under the authority of another. And I believe Paul is making this so crystal clear. He says, I belong to another and I'm under his authority and it's Jesus, and I surrender myself to Jesus as Lord, and I am his servant. My life's not my own anymore. I've given my life to Jesus, and as we give our lives to Jesus, we give it to him as Lord, which means we are no longer the ones calling the shots. We are no longer the ones in control of the thing. I'm under authority, and now I obey Jesus, Paul says, in everything I do. Even as we find out in this letter, as he writes, he's now in prison. He's in chains because of this. And he says, that's okay. I'll be in prison for this because this is what Jesus wants from me, and here I am. In fact, we know it's by the end of this letter and not long after that, he is martyred. He is put to death for preaching Jesus in, in their world. And, and he says, that's fine. Put me to death. I'm, I'm okay with that because Jesus is Lord, and I've surrendered myself to him. See, I believe this is probably the hardest part of our faith right here. Is Jesus Lord of our lives, and we've surrendered ourselves completely to Jesus, or do we like Jesus and we allow him to be the co-pilot here and every once in a while let him have some decisions? That's the question. Paul says it's clear. I've given myself completely over to Jesus. So when we think about that idea, we are servants of the Lord, that's powerful. But there's another aspect to it. He's saying, not only am I a servant because I've surrendered myself completely to Jesus, but now it's my servanthood, my loving service that I give to Jesus is shown in my loving servanthood of serving other people and doing what I'm called to do. So if we are servants of the Lord, it means, one, it's up to God. We surrendered. And number two, it's out to other people. We're surrendering ourselves to do the things that Jesus wants us to do. And this is important because if you remember as we went through this sermon series, um, Paul says that Jesus took on upon himself the servant's nature, the very nature of servanthood. Jesus brought it upon himself. So it's big, it's important. Paul says, I want you to understand this. This is how we're supposed to live our lives. In the first part of this letter, he says something very interesting as well. He says, this letter is written to all the saints. Now, I know that saints today is not one of the words we think about too much unless you're thinking about a New Orleans football team. But saints today, uh, unless you're in a Catholic church, you don't hear a whole lot about saint this or saint that. 
But the reality is what that word it means in that original language, our saints are God's holy people, or people who are set apart as holy unto God. See, God is, uh, uh, and here's what Paul wants us to understand, we're all saints as believers, okay? Every person he wrote to were the saints. We today, those who believe in Jesus, who are being set apart for God, we are saints, and this is written to us. Saints of the Lord. These, we're the people who are, who are holy, we are set apart, and reflecting God's character and nature within our lives. So this amazing passage that Paul gives us, that God's at work in us, and he's going to bring to completion the work that he began. As, when I read through that, I thought, oh, there's another passage I've got to throw out here for you. And the passage I'm going to give you today is, is Hebrews 10, 14. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. By one sacrifice, God has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And, and in one sentence, it says, number one, it's a finished work. God has made perfect forever, which means there's a finished work that's taken place within our lives. Boom, this thing is done. Beginning, end, it's taken care of. And yet, in that very same sentence, he says, also, it's a work in progress. Those of us who are being made holy. And if you look at that in the original language, that it's a present tense thing. It's something that's a continuous action happening. It's an ongoing action that God is at work within us. I truly believe our sanctification is a daily, ongoing process in our lives where God's at work within us, helping us be the people that we've been called to be. I know it's hard for us to understand this, but I think a God who's not bound in time like we are can look at something and see something as beginning and end, completed and finished, and yet at the same time see it working itself out in the process. Does that make sense? See, God sees it, and he plans it, and he puts it together because we have a God who finishes what he starts. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing that we're going to look at today and see within our lives. And I believe this is a lifelong process of a work in progress, and yet God says, I see it even as completed in the midst of it. <clears throat> so Paul says this, I am confident of this, I am sure of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He will finish it and carry this thing to completion. But this is what the Bible's about, if we really think about it. Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, it says, right? In the beginning, before there was anything of creation in the midst that we know it. In the beginning, it says God began to do these works of creation. How did God do it? I don't know. I'm not God. But somehow God brought about these works and these things of creation in the midst of it. And as it gets through in what the Bible calls seven days, we don't know if it was seven literal days or if it could have been seven million years. We don't know what that is at this point. But what we do know is, is that this thing is finished. And then we get to Genesis 2, 2, and it says, and, and God finished the work of creation. You see, there was a beginning, there was an ending, and he brought this thing about. Now, there's lots of stuff that takes place in creation and is still going on today, but it, there was a beginning, there was an ending, he finished it. You look at John 19, 30. Jesus is hanging upon the cross, and you know what he says? His last words of life, it is finished. What does he mean by that? Since, since the beginning, when the fall of humanity came, sin came into this world, God's been at the work of redemption of humanity and people. And it started in the Old Testament even um, with a sacrificial system. An innocent animal died, and the blood that was shed covered sin. I don't know why that works for God, but it works for God. That's how it took place. That's what God did. Even from the very beginning, if you look at Adam and Eve and you read back through Genesis chapter 3, <clears throat> you see they, they walked around, they weren't clothed, they were perfectly fine, everything was great. Sin comes into their lives and all of a sudden shame comes over them and they hide from God, of course, and, and they, they realize they're naked. And then you, there's this little line there you wouldn't even pay attention to and it says, as God's getting through this process, it says, he clothed them with animal skins. And you go, Vaughn, go, oh, don't think about it. But then you have to think about it. Wait a minute. How did God have animal skins? There's only one way. Sacrifice. <laughs> wow. 
for sin. So for the, God's at work in this process, making this thing happen. And finally, Jesus dies upon the cross and he cries out, it's finished. The work of redemption is done. Nothing else has to happen anywhere in this world for all of eternity because it's been accomplished, the work of redemption. But guess what? We are still in that process of redemption in our lives, aren't we? It's finished, yes, but yet it's still ongoing. Or we could look like Revelation 21. God says, it's finished. The old has passed away. All things are new. I finished. There was a beginning point. There's an ending point. I have purpose the entire way through this. But here we are, beginning to end. It is finished, and I brought it to conclusion. See, I believe the beauty of all of this is seen in how God conceived and brought about this amazing work of art, is all I can think of to call it, called creation and the purpose that that belongs in the midst of creation. God saw the full picture from beginning to end. I mean, it's even in the names that God gives himself. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last, a God of purpose in the midst of this. See, this gives me, and I think it should give everyone who believes, an amazing sense of hope and an amazing sense of peace in the midst of this, that right here, God is in control. Could we believe God is in control? I know it doesn't seem like that in our world sometimes, but God is in control. Here's the reality. Um, This world is not the enemies. (laughs) God is in control. This world is not humanities. God is in control. Yeah, we've been called to be good stewards of the world, but it doesn't mean we're the ones in control of it. God is in control of this thing. Yes, evil still exists. Yes, there's still an enemy who wants to do nothing more than steal, kill, and destroy life as God wants it for us. Yes, we still have free will to make bad choices sometimes and cause a lot of havoc. Yet I still believe God is big enough, God is smart enough, and God is powerful enough to be in control, and he's able to finish what he starts. Could we believe that? See, that changes how we view things if we truly believe this, that God's at work and able to finish these things. In the whole picture of creation, then, the end exists in the beginning, and there's purpose through it all. As I shared in the first service, um, there are people who, who are atheists, don't believe in God, whatever it is. And they say, how did the earth come about? How did life come about? Well, their idea is they've, they, they've held on to something that we've already proven can't happen. It's called the law of biogenesis, which means nothing living can come from something non-living. But we have to stand in faith, they say, that somehow something living just kind of popped out of nowhere and started living, and that's how life happened. You see, it was an accident, And if it's an accident, there's no purpose in the midst of it, then somehow in the end there'll be another accident of some sort and and the world's going to end and everything's just gone away. But if you see it as Scripture sees it, the whole of Scripture, there's a beginning, there's purpose, there's an end. You see the difference? How you live your life is very different depending on how how you view that. As I once read then, if this is with purpose, if the, if the whole idea is that God can truly finish what he has started, I read this. It means there is no problem we face for which God does not already have a solution for us. There's no problem you face which God doesn't have a solution. Number two, in the same idea, there's no struggle for which God does not already have an answer and rest. And as we give ourselves fully to God, God is at work with purpose and understanding to finish that work. If you heard me Wednesday night, you heard me uh, tell this story. Uh, Michelangelo one time, um, someone came up to him as he was chipping away at a sculpture, and they said, what are you doing? And he said this, I'm releasing the angel imprisoned in this marble. I thought, oh, is that a beautiful thought, isn't it? I'm releasing the angel imprisoned in this marble. And I've talked to artists and I've talked to sculptors who, who do this. And what they tell me is this. They say, I, you look at this big piece of rock and marble and they say, I see what's there, the image of that I want to bring about. I see the ending of it and then I begin to chip away and make it happen. And so often as I just look at this picture right here, I think, man, that is my life right there. 
It's like God says, I see this beautiful ending here. He's just not quite there yet. He's still chipping away at places in my life going, ooh, you see, here, here, here we are. There's the beginning. I see it. I already see the end. I already see exactly what it's going to be. I'm just not quite there yet. Do you see how that works? That's a beautiful picture of God at work within us. Because I truly believe that we are all under construction. Did you believe? Can you believe that we're all under construction? Now, in Indiana, there are two seasons, they say, winter and road construction, right? Everybody believe that? And if you've driven around town, you know that's what it is, okay? Isn't the most wonderful feeling in the world as you're driving through road construction? It's bumpy, it's rough, it's slow, it's frustrating, and you finally see this most beautiful, beautiful sign at the end of it, right? In construction, you're like, yes! (laughs) And you can finally start driving away. We long for that day when God can look and say, end of construction, all right? Here we are. There was a beginning, there's an ending, and we finished it. We're waiting for that day when all of creation will have found its purpose in the God who finishes. I read this in the Daily Bread not long ago, that little magazine, devotional, and it says this, and I thought Ecclesiastes is a neat little passage here. It says, he has made everything beautiful in its time, and I believe God is this artist that does so. And he's put eternity into our hearts, into who we are, that we can, so that we can know that God, what God has done from the beginning to the end. There's that whole idea that we begin to see the fullness of that picture and that God has purpose in this. It says, the creator always finishes what he started, Always. All of his masterpieces, planned in eternity past, begun in time, brought to fulfillment in eternity future. And that's when each of us believers will be completely conformed to his image. And and we now struggle to be more Christ-like in our lives. But we can be confident that one day we will reach that goal. That God is molding us into the trophies of grace fashioned to be like his son. And he leaves nothing undone. See, I truly believe that God is the great... Uh, artist who brings together these masterpieces. And I believe that each and every one of us is a masterpiece with God's signature upon it. Could you believe that about your life? That you're a masterpiece with God's signature upon it. I always throw out Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. I think it's just the most amazing 10 verses that explains uh, everything (laughs) in 10 verses. It's just a powerful scripture. And basically, this is what Paul tells us, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. He says, number one, everybody outside of Jesus is dead in your sins. You're all dead in your sins. Every single one of us at one point in time has been dead in our sins. You're either dead spiritually or you're separated from God. We're all heading to a place of being dead physically in this world because of the curse of sin that's here. You're all dead in your sins. But here's the great news. Because of God's incredible love for you, because of his mercy, he has made you alive in Jesus. Ooh, that's good. And he's lifted you up and set you in the heavenly realms just where Jesus is. And then he goes on, he says, it's all about God's grace that you've been saved and made alive. You see, you have faith in God's grace, and it's not about your works or the good things you do. You're never going to earn a place with God through that. But, but here's in verse 10 what I believe is so powerful. God says this, we are God's poema in the original language, poem, God's workmanship, God's work of art, God's masterpiece is what he's saying. Created in Jesus to do good works prepared in advance for us. God's at work bringing about this beautiful thing within our lives if we could trust that there's a God who finishes what he starts. Now, it can be a slow process, and it doesn't always happen overnight. Yeah, I know there are places where God brings healing immediately, and that's great. There's, there's times when, when, when you could be set free in a moment. There's times when you would pray for change, and immediately it happens, and you can say, yes, thank you, Lord. But from the beginning to the end often takes time. And you see, our sanctification takes time, where the amazing grace of God gets at work in our hearts and our souls, and God begins to mold us, and God begins to transform us, and God begins to be a, a, in an amazing work within our lives. And so today, I'm asking you, please don't lose heart and trust that God's at work in us. He's at work in our lives. He's at work in our church. He's at work in our world. 
You know, construction projects sometimes take a long time. They sometimes seem very confusing if you're not holding the blueprints right in front of you, everything that's going on. You say, eh, I don't know, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know where we're going in the midst of this thing. It's okay. It can be really messy and confusing. And sometimes our lives even have to get a little messier to get better. I, I always learned that when we, my dad would say, okay, it's time to clean the basement or it's time to clean the garage. And you thought, oh, it looks decent in there, you know. And you know what you had to do? You had to take everything out, didn't you? And you set it outside and there's piles of junk everywhere. And then and you clean it all out and then, then you get to put it back in. It's in order. And it's like, oh, that looks good once it gets inside of there again. Sometimes in our lives, we see all the piles of junk laying out there and we think, man, it's a mess. I, there's just no hope in the midst of this. And I'm telling you, there is because God, is, he's a mess master at this of, of deconstruction before reconstruction in our lives. God finishes what he starts. Paul says, I'm convinced of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion and help you to be all that you've been created to be in Christ Jesus. Isn't that the most amazing? That's just beautiful stuff. We got to trust it, to truly trust that God's going to do it within our lives and not lose hope. So here's my questions I'm laying out for you. And then we're going to sing this final song and, uh, as a commitment in our lives. Can you believe that God has seen the end in your beginning? Wow. God's seen the end in your beginning. But I'm not there yet, God. It's okay. <laughs> God says, I, I, I know where I'm going with this. Purpose. That God has a perfect purpose and plan to help you be all that you were created to be. Could you believe that? See, I'm not sure where your life is under construction right now, but I know God's at work in you. I know it because we're still here. God loves you. God wants what's best for you, and he will make that happen as we surrender ourselves to God and allow him to work and then put into practice what God wants us to do and live the way God wants us to live. So please just take a moment, and if you would do this, remember God's faithfulness and just how faithful God is. Remember where God is leading you to a finish point, a conclusion, and would you commit yourself to God and the process? Because I truly believe this, just like Paul, I'm convinced that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. Amen?